Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today we're asking, why are there antis in poker? This is an excellent application of Bayesian Nash equilibrium, so let's get right to it. You have a deck of 13 cards in front of you, 2 through ace. I have an identical deck in front of me, also 2 through ace. And in this very simplified game of poker, each of us is going to draw at random from our individual decks and privately look at it. So I'll take a card from mine, I'll see it, you'll take a card from yours, you'll see it, but you can't see my card, and I can't see your card. After we've seen what we're privately holding, we'll each choose whether to bet $1 or fold. If at least one of us folds, then both of us will receive no money. The game will not be played under those conditions. If I fold, or you fold, or we both fold, the game is not played. The game only is played if both of us bet, and in that case, we reveal the card that we're holding, the high card wins a dollar, the low card loses a dollar, and in the event that we both show the same card, no money exchanges hands. This is an example of a game where there isn't any ante. In just about every form of poker, before the game even starts, the players pony up some money on the table which means that if you take a card and then you immediately fold it, you're actually going to be losing money. Here, that's not the case. Here, if you draw a card and immediately fold, nothing happens. No money exchanges place. So that's the game. You might want to take a moment now to pause the lecture and think about what the solution to this might be. If you have some sort of thought about it, go ahead and put it in the comment section below. But otherwise, I will go ahead and get to solving it. A first pass solution that a lot of people will give to this game is that if you have a 9 or better, you should bet. And if you have an 8, then maybe you should bet, maybe you shouldn't. And if you have a 7 or lower, then you definitely shouldn't bet. The idea here is that 8 is the median card, which means if you have a 9 or better, then there's greater than a half chance that you're holding a card that is higher than your opponent. And if you have a 7 or lower, then there's a less than one half chance that you're holding a card that is higher than your opposing card. Whereas if you have an eight, then you're dead center. And so, you know, maybe you should bet, maybe you shouldn't, maybe probably doesn't even matter what you do. Unfortunately, that's actually not the solution. And you're going to see why in just a moment. But first, we need to think about how we're going to solve this game. And of course, we're doing a unit on Bayesian-Nash equilibrium. So we need Bayesian-Nash equilibrium to solve this game. And the reason, of course, is that we have private information. I draw a card, I know what I'm holding, I don't know what you're holding. And the same is true the other way around. You don't know what I'm holding, but you know what you're holding. So I don't actually know what your payoff is, and I don't know actually what my payoff is, because I need to know what you're holding to be able to answer that. So if we were to go about solving this in the way that we've seen before, what we could do is mash all of the different possibilities of hands that are being held by their relative probabilities and smush it all into a single game matrix and then use Nash equilibrium to solve that. But I've also alluded to the fact that that's not practical in a lot of cases. And here, that's one of them. This is not practical at all. If we think about the strategy sets of each player, well, each player has 13 types, one of each of the cards that he could draw, we have to develop a strategy for each player for each type. So no matter what card you draw, we need to be able to explicitly say what the player is going to be doing based off of the type given to him by the random draw of the deck. Well, each type has two strategies, either to bet or fold, which means if we think about the number of pure strategies available to every single player, there are two strategies for 13 types, so 2 to the 13th power gives us that information, which means there are 8,192 pure strategies for each player, which then means that if we're developing a matrix for this, we have an 8,192 by 8,192 frame or cell matrix, which would give us a total of 67,108,864 total cells. So unless we want to be here for a century working out all of the different probabilities and mushing it into a matrix, we should probably figure out a different way to try to solve this. 
And that's where the last lecture comes in. Last lecture, we learned about dominated strategies. Can you think about any dominated strategies here? Well, for the ace type, if you get dealt an ace, betting will weakly interim dominate not betting for you. The reason is that not betting guarantees you no money at all. Betting, on the other hand, cannot result in a loss. If you have an ace, you can't possibly lose. You have the highest card of all. And will result in a gain if any non-ace type bets. If 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to ace bets with any sort of probability, then you're going to be making money. That means that the ace type has a weekly dominant strategy to bet. Now, what we're going to do from here on in is assume that this ace type is going to bet. You might recall that if you eliminate weekly dominated strategies in this Bayesian Nash equilibrium framework, you might actually delete some of the equilibria. And it's actually going to be the case. I'll talk about that a little bit in the moment. But for now, let's look at what happens if the ace type does bet for sure which is his weekly dominant strategy, knowing that in the remaining game, just like with weak dominance previously, whatever Beja Nash equilibria we'll find here will also be Beja Nash equilibria even if we didn't eliminate that weekly dominated strategy. Given that Ace is betting, what should 2 do? Well, 2 can't win under any circumstances. If it bets, the best 2 can hope for is a draw by the other player also having a 2. On the other hand, if it bets, it's definitely going to lose some portion of the time now that we know that the ace will be betting. And that means that folding will strictly dominate betting for the two type. Now let's take that information and go a step further. Let's think now about whether three should bet. Three can only win if two bets. There's no other lower cards out there, so for three to be able to make any money by betting, it needs to be the case that two is betting. But we know from the previous slide that 2 is going to fold. 2 will not bet here. 3, as a result of ace betting, will definitely lose some portion of the time if it bets. So if it can never win, and it will definitely lose some portion of the time, that means folding and receiving nothing strictly dominates betting for the 3 type. So we're using iterated elimination of dominated strategies here, and we're actually getting somewhere. You should see where this is going. Let's think about what 4 should do here. 4 can only win if 2 or 3 bets, but we know from the previous two slides that 2 and 3 aren't betting. Because Ace is betting, 4 will definitely lose some portion of the time, which means that folding strictly dominates betting for the 4 type. We can use that information to go another step. What about 5? Well, 5 can only win if 2, 3, or 4 bets. We know that 2, 3, and 4 aren't betting from the last three slides. It's definitely going to lose some portion of the time because the ace will be betting. And so folding and receiving nothing strictly dominates betting, never winning, and sometimes losing if you're the 5 type. Now you should see where this logic is going. All of this applies all the way through. The logic goes all the way up until you get to that king type. 2 is not going to bet, which causes 3 to not want to bet, which causes 4 not to want to bet, and then 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, jack, queen, and even the king type doesn't want to bet. The king type wants to bet as long as perhaps there's some chance it will be facing 2 through queen, but it's not going to be facing 2 through queen. All of those guys are going to be folding, which means that the king type should fold as well. And that allows us to arrive at a Bayesian Nash equilibrium. And in that equilibrium, only the ace type bets. If you're the ace type, you bet. If you're two through king, you fold. So that's a Bayesian Nash equilibrium of this game. Before leaving, though, I have a few closing notes. First, after all, this lecture was titled, Why Are There Antis in Poker? So why are there antis in poker? Well, this game reveals that without antis, only the unbeatable type has incentive to bet. And this is going to be true regardless of what type of poker game that you're playing. Even if you're drawing five cards, if it's a five card game, under those circumstances, the only type that would want to bet if there's not an ante would be the type that holds a royal flush. So you need antes in order to force players to move, to give them incentive to try to bet on hands which could be beaten. Second, these cascade effects are common in games of incomplete information. 
What I mean by a cascade effect here is that two doesn't want to bet, which causes three to not want to bet, which causes four to not want to bet, and so forth. It's a cascade effect. We'll actually see another example later on in this course, but if you want to see another one right now, you could flip over to the bargaining course and check out something known as the market for lemons. It actually was a really neat finding that won a Nobel Prize. Last closing note here is that there are other equilibria. As I mentioned earlier, at the beginning of this, we eliminated a weakly dominated strategy for the ace type. Turns out there are more equilibria in which the ace type actually places some positive probability on folding as well. You might want to think about that a little bit more and why that's the case, but we're not going to cover it here. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I hope to see you next time when we get to more applications of Bayesian Nash equilibrium.